We are delighted to welcome you to this session of the 15th Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol Banega Swast India. It is our pleasure to present today Zhuang Zhang, China's legendary pilgrim and translator, Benjamin Brosi, in conversation with William Dalrymple. Benjamin Brosi is a specialist in the history and culture of medieval Chinese Buddhism. His most recent work of non-fiction, Zhuang Zhang, China's legendary pilgrim and translator, chronicles the astonishing history of the Buddhist monk Zhuang Zhang, his study of authentic Buddhist doctrine and practice at Nalanda, and the journey across thousands of miles, monasteries and monuments, where he learned with the leading teachers of the day. In conversation with historian, writer and festival co-director William Dalrymple, Brosi discusses the legacy of Zhuang Zhang and the trove of Buddhist teachings he returned with to China. Benjamin Brosi is an associate professor of Chinese religions and Buddhist studies at the University of Michigan. His most recent publications include Taming the Monkey, Reinterpreting the Zhi Yu Zhi, Journey to the West in the Early 20th Century. William Dalrymple is one of Britain's great historians and the best-selling author of the Wolfson Prize winning White Mughals, The Last Mughal, which won the Duff Cooper Prize, and the Hemingway and Kapusinski Prize winning Return of a King. His most recent book, The Anarchy, was long listed for the Bailey Gifford Prize 2019, among others. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, the Royal Asiatic Society, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and was presented with the prestigious President's Medal by the British Academy for his outstanding literary achievements and for co-founding the Jaipur Literature Festival. Please feel free to send in your comments by typing them in the comment section. Do follow our social media handles to get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2022 and tag at Jaipur Litfest. Ladies and gentlemen, Zhuang Zhang, China's legendary pilgrim and translator, Benjamin Prozi, in conversation with William Dalrymple. We are very privileged to bring to Jaipur uh, Benjamin Brose, whose fantastic book, Xuan Zhang, China's legendary pilgrim and translator, uh, is by far the most accessible and scholarly book uh, on this crucial figure in both Indian and Chinese history. I'm going to hand straight over to Ben to get on with his presentation uh, and then engage him in conversation at the end of it. So uh, Ben, over to you. Um, I, I, before he starts, though, let me say again, I thought this was the most spectacular book, and uh, I'd recommend it to anyone uh, who wants to know more about uh, Buddhist India uh, and about uh, Xuanzang himself. Go for it, Ben. Great. Thanks so much, Will. It's, a, it's an honor to, to be a part of this festival. I, I wish I could be there in person, but we'll make do over Zoom. And so I put together um, a little presentation with some images to sort of walk through some of the, the points of the book. Um, so let me just start with that. So this, this is Xuanzang, um, at least how people imagined Xuanzang after his death. So, uh, you know, I think it's safe to say one of the most intrepid, one of the most accomplished travelers in, in the history of the world, really. So in the seventh century, he embarks on this epic pilgrimage, um, walking from uh, the capital of China, um, Chang'an here, um, all the way up through uh, what is now Xinjiang, over the mountains into Central Asia. So he's passing through Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, all the way into Kashmir, Northern India, Southern Nepal, to get to his destination, which is the monastic center of Nalanda, which is now in Bihar. Um, so he is crossing through all these regions. Here's, here's a map trying to retrace his route here. You get a sense of um, the, the ground that he covered um, going through Central Asia and into, into India. He doesn't stop in Northern India, but he goes on to Bangladesh. He goes down the Eastern coast of India, back up the Western coast. So all in all, you know, we don't know exactly how many miles he covers, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000. Um, he does this in just under 17 years. So it's a very, very long, very, very extensive pilgrimage. 
And he's not the first um, person to do this by any means. He's not even the first Chinese Buddhist monk to do this. Um, people had come before him. Merchants were really making this trip all the time, as were diplomats sort of moving back and forth uh, between these kingdoms. So he's not really a pioneer in that sense. He's not the first person to go to India by any means. Um, but he's unique for a number of different reasons, um, one of which is his really remarkable career after he comes back to China. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but the other is that he left a, a really extensive record of his travels. Um, there are really two records. Um, the first is the Datang Xiuji, and this is translated into English as the record of the Western regions. And this he wrote at the request of the Chinese emperor after he comes back to China. Um, and so it's a kind of official report. He's writing for uh, the curious reader, talking about what the climate is like in different places, what the people are like, what kinds of customs they have, what sort of legends they tell, and so forth. But he's also writing specifically for the Chinese court. And so he's taking note of things like population size, kinds of products they produce, what are the states of their defenses? What, uh, how receptive might they be to Chinese rule? So it sometimes is a little bit of intelligence gathering in this document, uh, but he's also, of course, this really devout and pious Buddhist monk. So he is paying close attention to the state of Buddhism and all the places he's passing through. So he's noting down the number of monasteries, the number of uh, monks living in different monasteries, different places, what traditions are they upholding, what texts are they reading, and so forth. So this document is, is just an incredibly rich source of information, incredibly rare source of information about 7th century India. We really don't have since India and Central Asia, there's nothing really comparable. So that's the first document. The second is this biography that his disciples began while he was still alive and completed shortly after his death. If the record of the Western regions is kind of a impersonal um, sort of accounting of the different places that he visited, the biography is a personal account. It's a really an, an intimate um, story of his life, all the way from his birth and precocious childhood up until he passes away in his 60s. Um, so it doesn't just talk about the places he goes, but it talks about what that was like, you know, what it felt like to cross the mountains, um, the different kinds of dangerous situations he got into, the great triumphs he experienced. Um, it's a much more compelling, much more dramatic account. Um, and so these sources allow us to reconstruct a lot of what was going on back in that time and reconstruct a lot of his life. Um, the biography, the first half of it talks about his time in India, and this is the part that's really well known. It's the part that was first translated into European languages, first French and then English, and now um, pretty much every language there's, there's a version of this. Um, the second half of the biography talks about his time once he returns to China, and he really go goes on to have a remarkable um, career there. When he initially left, he was in his late 20s, and he defied a, a ban on travel outside of China's borders. He wasn't supposed to leave. He asked for permission. Permission was denied. He went anyway. Um, so he had broken the law, and when he finally returns over 16 years later, He's a little bit nervous about how he's going to be received, whether he's going to be punished or not for, for breaking the law. Um, but of course, he receives this hero's welcome. He's um, appointed to a newly built, the most prestigious, opulent monastery in the capital, um, which you can see here. Um, he goes and gets funding to build this massive um, stupa tower uh, to house these hundreds of texts and images and relics that he's brought back from India. Um, he's a confidant of two emperors, uh, advising them, sort of accompanying them when they travel, um, as well as one empress, right? the, the famous Wu Zetian, the only woman ever to rule China as an emperor. And in fact, he even serves as a kind of foster father to her infant son, the crown prince. Um, so he's doing all this, these diplomatic duties, 
Um, he's overseen a massive 23 person translation team. And he's also training a generation of monks, right? Who are coming to study with him from all parts of China and as, from as far away as Korea and Japan. So Xuanzang, in short, is this really, really busy guy once he comes back from India. Um, and you can get a sense of this by the kinds of um, the, the output of his work, right? So this is, this is the, the, a modern day picture of the great wild goose pagoda where he initially had built to store his text. Um, of the text that he brought back, he and his team translate 74. Um, some of these are, are pretty short, like the Heart Sutra, just a single page. Others are these massive 600 chapter works. So all in all, he translates um, well over 1,300 scrolls of text. Right? This is a massive output. So to give a, a point of comparison, it's roughly 25% of the entire Buddhist canon at the time. Right? So no one has ever come close either before or after to that kind of output. And not only is he um, productive, but his translations are famously accurate and faithful to the original Sanskrit text. So he's, he's still um, widely uh, studied for that reason. Um, you can get a sense of his work ethic from his daily schedule, um, which fortunately his disciples recorded. Uh, so let me just read you what they wrote. It's a brief passage. Um, he made a schedule every day. If his work weren't finished during the day, he continued at night. He would put down his brush only after the second watch. So this is between nine and 11 o'clock at night. After studying sutras, he'd venerate the Buddha, practice the way, going to sleep in the third watch. So between 11 and one. Rising during the fifth watch, between three and 5 a.m., he would read Sanskrit texts, mark out the sections that he wanted to translate the next day, and then every day after eating for two hours in the early evening, he lectured on new sutras and treatises to monks who had come from every province to resolve their doubts and inquire about the truth. And so he's sleeping, according to this account, three, four hours a night and just kind of working nonstop. So while in the West, uh, outside of China, outside of Buddhist circles, he's remembered as this great pilgrim. Um, within Buddhist circles in East Asia, he's also venerated as this tremendous um, patriarch, translator, and teacher. Right? Some of the texts that he translated um, are still recited daily, chanted daily in Buddhist monasteries right, throughout East Asia, China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and now in Europe, the United States, really all over the world. So his legacy is really everywhere. The, the tradition of Buddhism that he championed in China was called Yogacara, and that translates to the practice of yoga. It's this very sophisticated take on the structure of mind, the construction of experience, and the path to liberation. So in modern times, is sometimes is compared to kind of a proto-phenomenology for the detailed way in which it attempts to map the workings of consciousness. And this was an incredibly influential tradition in his time, and he's really responsible for establishing it in China and then throughout East Asia. But it falls out of favor, um, and just a few decades after his death, really, um, overshadowed by traditions that are still with us, like Zen and Pure Land, Tantric Buddhism. So within Buddhist circles, he's remembered as this great teacher, but the people who now read you know, Chinese translations of Sanskrit Yogacara texts right, is a very, very small uh, group. What he's mainly remembered for is this great adventure he goes on. This is what really gets people excited and, and sort of lodges in their minds. So that maybe I give a few brief highlights from that pilgrimage to give a sense of um, both what actually happened and kind of the myths that start to develop around that as time passes. Let me start with one of the more dramatic moments on his journey. Um, this is after he's been to the capital of northern India. He's sailing down the Ganges River, probably loaded down with texts and, and other um, images and, and objects, when his boat is overtaken by a group of pirates. Right? They force him to the shore, they force his party. Um, 
to the shore and they rifle through all of their baggage looking for valuables. It said they even strip search them to make sure they haven't hidden anything on their bodies. Um, and to make matters worse, these are not just bandits. They also turn out to be devotees of the goddess Durga and her annual human sacrifice is due. And the pirates decide that Xuanzang would make a perfect sacrificial offering. So they build this altar, um, ask him to take his seat upon it, and he apparently resigned to his imminent death, asks for a moment to kind of prepare himself and to get ready. And he goes into a kind of meditative state, um, sort of visualizing the pure land where he hopes to be reborn after he dies. But while he's doing this, this great storm um, breaks, winds start to howl, trees start to come crashing down, the waves are roiling, and the bandits, fearing that the goddess is displeased with their offering, call it off. They say, hey, we're not going to do this. This is a, this is a bad idea. Um, they try to, to break him out of his trance. It doesn't work. Finally, they ring a bell, and he opens his eyes, and he looks around and says, okay, are we ready now? Let's do this. Um, but of course, they they see him now as this great powerful teacher and they venerate him and they let him go safely on his way. Right. It's hard to know to what extent this, anything like this actually happened or to what extent this is his disciples really embellishing aspects of his life. Um, but it's these sorts of moments uh, that people remembered the most and sort of become the seeds which grow into these great legends uh, that culminate centuries later in stories like The Journey to the West, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. Xuanzang himself doesn't talk about this sort of thing. He doesn't really talk about himself at all in his own writings. Um, he, I think, mentions himself only twice in his entire record. He's just trying to recount things and record things. And his goal really is not some kind of personal adventure, but he wants to visit the places where the Buddha lived, where the Buddha taught, where the great teachers of the past had lived and taught. Um, and ultimately, he wants to get to this place. This is Nalanda. This is sort of a schematic drawing of, of the ruins which still exist in Bihar. This is the, um, the most prominent, um, most prestigious place of Buddhist learning in India during this time, this massive monastic complex, um, sometimes referred to as a university because it was a center of learning. Um, this is the ultimate goal of Xuanzang's pilgrimage. He wants to go and study there, study with the great teachers who live there. Um, and so he arrives um, and is granted admission, right? And so there's, there's roughly two to 3,000 monks when he visits, living in eight monastic complexes, which you can see here, um, lined up side by side. Each one has these living cells around these central courtyards. Um, and he's given a, a place on the fourth floor of one of these temples. Um, he describes this as, you know, an extraordinary place, um, incredibly uh, well kept with carvings and brightly painted um, facades and gardens and streams running into lotus ponds. So it's really... Um, a fantastic place for him to study, and it's drawing all the best minds, the best Buddhist minds, at least in India at the time. Um, so he stays here, basically studying different aspects of not only Buddhism and not only his Buddhist tradition, um, but a little bit of uh, every Buddhist tradition that was that was available for him to study at that time. This is what it looks like from above now, the, the ruins, you can see the foundations. Um, not only is he studying Buddhist texts, but he's studying uh, non-Buddhist subjects as well. So things like uh, grammar, medicine, divination, logic, the Vedas. So he's really striving for this comprehensive knowledge of all of Indian thought. If you think about what's going on here, it's pretty astounding. Um, not only has he traveled over 3,000 miles to get here right, on foot um, over the course of five years is, is about how long it took him, um, but he has learned to read Sanskrit, which is this notoriously difficult language. Um, and along the way, he's picked up some kind of vernacular language, some kind of Prakrit that he's using to 
talk with various monks and lay people and teachers, listen to the lectures that are being offered. Um, and he's learning the language, not just to the extent of being able to ask for directions or to order something, uh, buy something in the market, um, but he is reading and discussing um, some of the most complex and sophisticated texts that exist in the Buddhist tradition, a tradition which has no shortage of complex and sophisticated texts. Um, so even in one's native language, these texts are really hard to understand, and I speak from experience. Um, so the fact that he was able not just to, to read and discuss these things, but to really become a master of them, it, I think gives some evidence of what a remarkable mind he must have had. Right. Um, so in evidence of that, so one of the, the culminating points in his biography of his time in India um, is this great debate, which is the, the last thing I want to mention here. Um, the setting is that um, there are some monks in Southern India who represent a different Buddhist tradition, um, and they are disparaging the monks who live in the North, particularly at Nalanda, uh, for not really understanding proper Buddhism. And so the king, uh, King Harsha, who has just recently unified Northern India, decides to stage a debate so, okay, you monks from the south, you're going to debate our best monks in the north, and we'll see who's right. All right. So he turns to Nalanda and says, give me one of your best monks um, to, to sort of uh, to represent you in this debate. And according to Xuanzang's biography, he's the one, remarkably, that's chosen. And this great debate is held. Regional kings come, and Brahmins, and ascetics, and obviously Buddhists. Monks, everyone comes to see this, this great spectacle. Um, and Xuanzang takes his seat. Um, according to the biography, he's, he's written out his positions. And the challenge is for someone to refute them, to find the flaws in his logic. Now, the stakes in these kinds of debates are pretty high. So according to Xuanzang, the winner is treated like royalty. He's going to receive offerings. He's going to have all sorts of disciples, appointments to temples, and so forth, um, and obviously a, a boost to his reputation. But the losers, basically, um, you know, at, at the worst, they're going to be humiliated, kind of tarred and feather. He, he describes them being covered in mud and cast off into ravines. But in more extreme cases, um, they could even be executed. And that seems to be the terms of this debate. Um, apparently, Xuanzang says, if I lose... Um, I'll be beheaded. I'll submit to that. He's so confident in his position. Um, so he takes a seat, and for the first part of the debate, nobody challenges him. And on the contrary, people, some people in the audience seem a little bit annoyed, and they say, who does this guy think he is? You know, he's not even from around here, and he claims to, to know more than we do. Someone needs to do something. Maybe we need to take him out. And so rumors start to circulate that there's a plan afoot to, to do him harm. These rumors reach the king's ears, uh, and he makes an announcement that anyone who tries to harm Xuanzang is going to be executed on the spot. And if you so much as slander him, I'm going to cut, have your tongue cut out. So these are not great terms for free-flowing debate. You know, it kind of chills discussion, and nobody challenges him. He's declared the great winner um, and, uh, you know, reaps, reaps the rewards. Right? Shortly thereafter, he returns to China. The idea being there's nothing more for him to learn there. He may have come as a, as a student with questions, but now he's mastered everything to the extent that no one can even challenge him. So he goes back to China um, and begins that part of his career. Well, there's a lot to talk about there, but I thought... Um, in the interest of time, let me just focus on two aspects of the pilgrimage that kind of move in surprising directions uh, in, in the modern era. Um, the first has to do with his travel record. Um, so as I said, when this was translated into English, the first, the travel record and the first part of his biography, um, it became very, very important, not out of an interest in Buddhist doctrine, the kinds of things that Xuanzang was interested in, um, but because it was, appeared to give such an accurate sort of map of where Buddhist sites 
had been, right? It gives distances, it gives landmarks. And so British officials and archeologists see an opportunity to use this um, as a guide to go find lost ruined Buddhist sites. You know, at this time there is no, no Buddhism in India anymore. And a lot of the places have been forgotten. So you have people like Alexander Cunningham, who is the first to go around with a translation of Xuanzang's record and to try to track and locate, excavate, and often extract everything they can from these sites to send back to museums in Europe. Um, so this is his, his sketch of Nalanda. He's credited with sort of rediscovering Nalanda based on Xuanzang's description. So this, you know, this interesting full circle um, happening here. The other um, really famous, if not infamous figure in this regard is Sir Oral Stein. Um, he is pretty well known for these expeditions he took into Central Asia um, and especially well known for his most remarkable um, sort of haul, which were these thousands and thousands of texts which had been sealed up in a secret cave uh, in, in this uh, Buddhist cave complex of Dunhuang. Um, the story of him extracting them and sort of bringing them back to England is, is pretty well known. What is not so well known is that it was because of his devotion and his interest in Xuanzang, Steins, he called Xuanzang his patron saint. He used that knowledge to uh, negotiate with the caretaker of this site who venerated Xuanzang as a kind of deity. And so Stein makes the case that he's kind of like a modern day Xuanzang. He's traveled great distances far from home. Um, his goal is just to acquire Buddhist texts to bring back, to transmit to his people. And through some back and forth, he convinces the caretaker to part with thousands and thousands of, of manuscripts, which are now uh, in the British Museum and elsewhere. And this opens up kind of uh, a free for all with people coming um, from France, from Japan, from Russia, and basically cleaning out this, this cave. Here you see Paul Paleo in the cave itself, studying the texts by candlelight. He, he leaves with about 10,000 um, texts. So Xuanzang's record and his legacy um, sort of come back to the fore in the modern era because he's sort of portrayed as a great guide for all these ancient sites and his, his text is used for that reason. There's a second kind of unexpected uh, way that his travels uh, kind of transformed the way they were understood over time. And that has to do with what this caretaker was talking about, why he venerated Xuanzang as a kind of saint. Um, because after he died, uh, later generations started to think of him um, less like a human being who made this, this trip to India and back and more as a kind of saintly figure or as a kind of deity who received texts, not from teachers and monastic libraries in India and Central Asia, but from heavenly realms. Um, so here you see a, a scroll from Japan with Xuanzang surrounded by uh, different divine and demonic beings. He's got that backpack filled with scrolls. The idea being he's transmitting these from a kind of heavenly realm. These are sacred divine texts. Um, and he's made this passage from this human to a heavenly realm um, and returned. And so he's venerated for that reason in Japan. And separately in China, we start to see the same thing happening. This is from a mural um, painted inside an, a different Buddhist cave complex, one of many, many sites that show him together with this monkey attendant and a horse carrying this bundle of radiant texts on its back. Again, the idea is that this is the ultimate destination of Xuanzang's pilgrimage. Um, and he is not a historical figure, but a figure who's still accessible, you know, through ritual, through practice, through different kinds of visualizations, um, sort of a, a, a channel between human and heavenly realms. So this, these legends culminate in what most people are probably familiar with, this great novel that's written in China at the end of the 16th century called The Journey to the West. Um, this has Xuanzang as this kind of magical monk who travels through all these demonic realms um, in the company of this monkey attendant who's 
you know, an incredible martial artist, this um, strong but lazy pig, and this um, converted demon who becomes a monk um, called Sha Monk. And they travel um, through all these uh, really frightening, uh, hazardous realms until they eventually get to the realm of the Buddha, receive all these texts, and convey them back to China. Um, so people know this, whether through the novel or through television shows or through movies or now cartoons, um, video games, um, it's become really ubiquitous. It's like, it's like the Marvel franchise. I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he shows up in the next sort of superhero movie. He's the one who battles demons, you know, in order to secure treasure and truth and so forth. And so this is, has moved in all sorts of um, unusual directions, and I'll close with just two. Um, one is we have this Yogacara uh, court scholar who now is envisioned as uh, power forward in a street basketball tournament in this video game, which looks like it's set somewhere in Brooklyn. Um, so this is kind of a remarkable uh, trans transformation for this historical figure. Um, and the other one, which is even better attested, is this celibate conservative monk, um, frequently, regularly reimagined as a kind of young woman, right? And so what this might have to tell us about the way people today relate to Xuanzang, relate to Buddhism, relate to the tradition. Um, there's a lot to unpack there, obviously, but that would be a whole other talk and a whole other presentation. So. Um, maybe I'll just leave it there and we can chat a little bit. Ben, that was utterly fabulous. And, uh, I, I think we should get you straight back next year to do the, the second half, the legendary, uh, the legendary life. I'm particularly keen on, the, on your final video character. I want to know all about her. But um, going back to the original um, text, one of the big surprises reading it today is that, you know, there are so many books now about the Silk Road and, uh, and, we're, and we're given this impression of this almost of this, this motorway running between uh, notionally sort of Rome and, uh, and Chang'an. But, um, and yet when Huan Zhang does this trip, uh, you get the impression that it's almost impossible to travel along it, that, uh, uh, you know, he's, 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 one day he's nearly starving, another day he's his, his boat swept away on the Indus, then he's sort of traveling down glaciers that are uh, incredibly difficult. And then once he gets to India, there's bandits everywhere. Uh, yeah. And what does that say about the, about, about the Silk Road? Is it, a, is it an invention or, 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 or is it a real thing at, at this period? I mean, it's, I think it's both. I mean, it's, it's an invention in the sense that there is no there is no road, right? That sort of, you know, moves from point A to point B. What seems to be happening is that there are a kind of a, a series of different routes that are kind of always shifting depending on political conditions, you know, you know, as regimes change and as, you know, the, the situation with bandits change, you might take the Northern route or the Southern route or this pass or that pass, what are the conditions like? So it's not like, you know, a, a marked path like we think of as a road. Um, but it's, it's absolutely clear that people were making the passage, passages between China, um, parts of Central Asia and India on a, on a regular basis. We have, we have records of diplomats doing this, merchants are doing this, trading everything from tea to silk to minerals to different types of chemicals and other products. Um, so people are doing this and there are outposts in, in the Chinese capital, um, specifically where foreigners who have come from say, Samarkand might live, right? And there are paintings of Chinese uh, merchants in Central Asia. So we know that these, these, these things are happening all the time. But of course, it's incredibly dangerous, depending upon the conditions that it's not easy. There's all sorts of hazards. Um, I, that's where we get this idea of caravans, I think, because this is people would band together. Right? It's safer in numbers, especially if there are bandits about and there are examples in his record. You know, he's always traveling in a group. Sometimes he's traveling with a military escort, um, basically to keep himself safe. Right. And by and large, he does remain safe. And he does get rolled. He, on his way into India, he is actually. I mean, you mentioned the the Ganges pirates, but the earlier Ran Matara that he gets uh, uh, when he when he gets to India, he gets he gets stripped and uh, taken to the forest and take everything taken away. 
Yeah, he does, uh, you know, according to his biography, he gets robbed a couple of times. And even on his, there's this tragic story as he's on his way back. Um, not only does he lose some texts in the river, but he's been gifted this elephant by a regional king. And it's obviously, it's carrying a lot of the, he's bringing a tremendous amount of stuff with him back. And just when they're very close to getting back to Chinese territory and some bandits come, everybody panics and starts running around and the elephant appears to have just run into the river um, and drowned. Um, so they lose the elephant at the end of their journey and they're trying to figure out how to load up the horses to get back the rest of the way. So it's, it's a constant danger and they talk about how they would send someone up in front to tell them, listen, nothing we have is anything you want, right? You don't want these texts, you don't want these relics, you know, there's nothing of value, we're just monks, leave us alone. And I think by and large that seems to have worked, but of course there are always always dangers along the way. The other surprise is um, I was reading, there was a, a very good Marg volume on Nalanda by Fred Asher, who just died this year. Um, he, he kind of questions whether, I mean, in popular discourse, Nalanda is seen now to be a sort of, you know, like Harvard or Oxbridge, this fantastic center of, uh, of, of, of knowledge. Um, but Fred in, his, in that book makes the point that at the time it's always discussed as a, uh, as a monastery rather than a university, it's the Mahavira. Where do you stand on that debate? I mean, is it an entirely religious institution studying religious texts uh, or is it somewhere where you might have learned, you know, sort of Vedic mathematics and, uh, uh, and what we would today, you know, think of more as the secular science. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, to call it a, a university is anachronistic, right? Because there are no real universities in the seventh century. So um, I think it's a little bit of both because monasteries, both in China and in India, Buddhist monasteries are always places of learning, right? They, they're the places that have these, these well-stocked libraries. They're where you go if you want to study. So it wasn't, it's, it's about sort of understanding truth and that's not, by and large, the focus is on Buddhist doctrine, Buddhist practice, Buddhist theory and so forth. Um, but grammar is an important part of that. Um, different types of knowledge, whether it's mathematics or the calendar. A lot of the people, Chinese monks who come to, to India come back with calendrical knowledge and astronomical knowledge because it's all about learning, right? And it's not these strict lines that we are inclined to draw now. This is religious knowledge and this is secular knowledge. I don't think those lines were really recognized. It was knowledge, right? And a, a, an a attempt to get to the truth of things. And that spanned all sorts of different genres. You mentioned the, the Empress Wu Zetian and, 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 and how, uh, as we know, uh, slightly under the tutelage of, of Xuanzang. She, um, she very much uh, patronizes Buddhism. She also patronizes a lot of Indian uh, in the Chinese court. How far can, can, can one imagine sort of Indian culture and science making a, a major impression in China uh, at this period and, and the period immediately after Xuanzang? I think it's, it's clearly made an impression. I mean, this was, it was really the only um, incredibly advanced, sophisticated civilization that, that China was um, aware of and in contact with during that time. And so it became kind of exoticized. And so things coming from India, whether it was um, different types of products, um, different types of tradition, were kind of the rage in urban centers in China, right? It, it showed a kind of sophistication. And so we know that monks kept coming. So Xuanzang is hosting Indian monks. Diplomats are coming from India based on the kinds of relationships yeah, that he's from his friends, doesn't he? I mean, lovely idea, even, the, even at that period, you can, um, you know, you can, you can send uh, a letter from Nalanda to, uh, uh, and it'll arrive in Chang'an. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, and they, these, these monks come and they stay for a few months and then they take the letters back, you know, so it's probably taking years for this correspondence to happen but you know because of that we have these beautifully written letters you know people took a lot of time to write them they were so important and they're they're sending products back and forth they're sending texts so there's the lines of communication are open and there's even a, a monk from Gandhara I think with Xuanzang when he passes away so within his monastery he was hosting visiting monks from India so it's really um, it's amazing to think about what that those cultures must have been like within the monasteries. When um, 
Huangang describes Buddhism in India. There are places like London which are flourishing and uh, which are very much alive, but a, a lot of places like Gandhara are already in decline, and uh, and that decline obviously continues after uh, Xuanzang's uh, demise. Uh, what are the reasons for those that decline? And should we imagine a conf uh, conflict and competition between Hinduism and Buddhism, or is it just that passions change and 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 um, the new bhakti-oriented Hinduism is, is is more accessible, more attractive uh, to people? What what's the reason that uh, uh, Buddhism declined so far. Yeah, it's it's not entirely clear. So Xuanzang describes, especially the places that were once thriving centers that are now pretty much um, desolate or have been overtaken by other religious traditions. He describes sort of the Huns coming down from the north who who have this antipathy towards Buddhism and are just intentionally wiping out Buddhist monasteries. So there does seem to be some kind of overt conflict there and he he definitely references um if not outright conflict certainly competition between you know what we would call hindu traditions shaivite traditions and so forth and the buddhists right they're competing for patronage they're competing for recognition and resources um and often you know the there's one scene in his in his uh biography where one of the kings who who calls a great festival and is honoring Xuanzang, um, there's an attempted assassination on him by people who are not Buddhists and who feel like the, the king is unfairly, you know, revering these Buddhists at the expense of, of other religious traditions, other types of ascetics. So there, there is a tension there. Um, and, you know, when he is there in the seventh century, it's um, you know, you can see it very clearly in his travelogue that so there's sort of islands of real thriving Buddhist centers like Kashmir and Bihar and other places and other places that are really important in Buddhist history, uh, like the place where the Buddha was born or where he died that are just, you know, nothing's happening. It's just ruins of monasteries. And he is always complaining that the heretics or the devas have taken over these sites. So there's, you know, the story, traditional story is, well, after the, the Muslim invasions, you know, in the 12th, 13th century, everything, that's when Buddhism disappears in India. Um, but it was happening long before that. Right? It's sort of a gradual kind of erosion of, of its place of prominence within Indian culture seems to be what's going on. Ben, that's so fantastic. Thank you so much. I would recommend to anyone who wants to know more, uh, Ben, fantastic book. Xuanzang, China's legendary pilgrim and translator. Uh, it's a paperback, it's enormously accessible, but it contains all the latest scholarship uh, with fantastic bibliography and notes if anyone wants to read further. So uh, this figure who I know feels pretty dry in Indian history textbooks really comes alive uh, very movingly uh, in Ben's text. So uh, I highly, highly recommend it. And thank you so much, Ben, for joining us. Thank you, Well, It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Benjamin and William, for a delightful conversation unpacking the legacy of Zhuangzam. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. To stay tuned, to continue to watch our wonderful sessions and the JLF Writers Shorts, all of which have been specially curated for you.